So I'm Bernie Quarren. I manage the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program under the Adirondack Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. When you all see a picture like, of, like this, is your first thought, look at all that stored carbon? <laughs> it is for me now, after going through this process, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, it will be for you as well. So um, we're going to start with the basics. We have this process, a natural process called the greenhouse effect that has become unnatural as a result of human activity. We have increased levels of CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere that are inhibiting solar radi radiation from escaping the atmosphere, thus increasing the temperature of our atmosphere. We also have this natural process. You can tell me what the chemical equation of this is. Photosynthesis, yes. So um, we hear a lot about this in providing clean air to us, a lot of oxygen that we breathe. What we don't hear so much about is the amount of carbon that this is pulling out of the atmosphere and storing in plants on the landscape. So how much is stored and sequestered really comes down to two things. Sequestration is, a, is it equal to productivity of our plants on the landscape. So this is how quickly these plants are photosynthesizing, how much carbon they are pulling down from the atmosphere. And then storage is directly related to biomass. How much plant material is there on the landscape, whether it be in you know, grasses, grasslands, wetlands, or forests. But the most important one is in the woody material because this persists on the landscape for centuries. It's pulling carbon down from the atmosphere and storing it in that woody material for long periods of time. So the Nature Conservancy has a very fancy title for this. It's called Natural Climate Solutions. And it's really focusing on nature as a mechanism to, to tackle climate change. Historically, nature has been undervalued as something that can help us meet our climate reduction or carbon reduction goals. And I'm, I was going to show, show a quick video. I think I'm going to skip over just for the sake of time. But what we found is that nature can actually provide 37% or up to 37% of our carbon reduction goals over the next several decades in order to meet the Climate Paris Agreement objectives. And this is new research that was published in the National Academy of Sciences just last year. Um, please check it out when, if you have the chance. And there's several videos that describe this work under um, the Nature Conservancy. If you go to Google, just type in the Nature Conservancy and Natural Climate Solutions, you can read all about it and learn more about this work. But what they found is that there are opportunities where we can address um, or improve our ability to advance natural climate solutions. And I want to focus on these top three here, the first being reforestation, the second avoided forest conversion, and the third being natural forest management. These are the biggest things for our buck to have nature sequester more carbon and store more carbon on the landscape. So immediately, immediately when we think about deforestation, forest conversion, our minds go to places like South America, to Africa, to developing countries where uh, you know, rainforests are being cut down, urban sprawl is taking over and, and changing forests into agricultural land or pavement. And you would be right, you know, there are, this is happening across the globe, and unfortunately we're not doing a good job at advancing reforestation goals, advancing, advancing um, conversion goals. This study just came out last month that showed that global deforestation is on an upward trend, jeopardizing efforts to tackle climate change and the massive decline in wildlife. They found that every second about a soccer field's worth of forest is lost. That equals to about the size of New York City every day and over the course of the year the size of Italy. However, it's also happening here at home. This is a natural land cover data set that shows forest to development conversion for the Northeast in New England. And you can see that even here in Massachusetts, we are seeing some forest conversion to development. We also have something else going on, which I'm going to focus on today. We have a lot of forest pests and pathogens that are already here or on their way. And we also have native pests and pathogens. So emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, mountain pine beetle, spruce budworm, the list goes on and on. There's actually 60 introduced invasive pests and pathogens in the country now, over 60. And we also have these native pests that are here and have increased impacts as a result of climate change. We have to remember that this process has been happening for quite some time. Over the past 150 years, these pests have been introduced to the country. And our forests are actually still recovering from the losses in biomass as a result of logging and um, these, these first pests that were introduced to the landscape, such as 
um, American chestnut blight, and Dutch elm disease. These trees were massive. This one um, elm tree in New England, they said was about 400 years when they lost it, 400 years old, old when they lost it, and it could shade the entire community underneath it. Okay, so how does, how does um, forest pests and pathogens affect carbon storage and sequestration? So I wanna go quickly through what a natural system looks like. So these are pre-attack levels on our forest. Productivity and biomass are kind of flatlined, they're maintained. Then we have, let's say, a native predator come in that's taking out some of those weakened trees or old trees that are um, under stress. So we lose some of those individual tree species. Productivity goes down for a little bit, but biomass is fairly maintained. But then what happens is we start having regeneration from those surrounding trees, and actually, surprisingly, both productivity and biomass goes up. Uh, productivity isn't really surprising, but biomass goes up, one, because that, that stored carbon in that dead trunk is still there. It's just fallen on the ground and slowly decomposing. It's still stored in the forest. And we now have new species taking over that area that was once occupied by that living tree. And eventually, as those trees fully recover, productivity and biomass goes back to its standard or flat level. So pre-attack levels and post-attack levels are fairly constant. Now let's look at a scenario that's an invasive forest pest or pathogen. Same thing, pre-attack is, is constant levels. Then we have an invader come in. In this instance, it's, let's say it's something like emerald ash borer hemlock woolly delta that has extirpated this tree species from the landscape or in the process of extirpating a tree species from the landscape. In this case, productivity goes down in the near term. The tree falls over, it starts decomposing, the carbon is still stored on the landscape. But the difference is you don't have those, that tree species regenerating itself. You have these other species that are still on the landscapes taking its place. So long-term productivity and biomass depends on the productivity of that replacement species and its maximum achieved biomass. That's what's going to determine whether it's going to have more potential to sequester carbon or less. So let's look at an example of hemlock woolly adelgid. We really hear about three different species that are taking up hemlock space as hemlock woolly adelgid exudates it from the landscape. And those three species are rhododendron, black birch, and red maple. So if you think about rhododendron, productivity is probably going to go up as a result of it taking hemlock's place, but biomass is probably going to go way down. You know, it's never going to grow as big as hemlock. It's never going to occupy as much space as hemlock. So in this instance, you kind of have a, a positive and a negative. Then you have black birch, probably going to be more productive than hemlock and maintain that same level of biomass. So in this instance, you actually have an improvement, the amount of carbon sequestered in that environment. And then lastly, red maple. Again, we have something that's probably going to be more productive than hemlock, but less biomass. Okay, let's look at another example. In this instance, we're focusing on a pest that is a generalist. So something like Asian longhorn beetle that comes into the landscape. So it's introduced and it spreads to the full range of host trees that it can feed on. In this instance, obviously we lose a lot of productivity and biomass all at once. So in the near term productivity declines, biomass still remains constant because those dead standing trees are on the landscape. Longer term, as those trees succumb, and fall and decompose, both productivity and biomass go down. It's important to note that when pr productivity and biomass both go down, that's when a forest no longer is a carbon sink, it, it's actually a source. It becomes a source of carbon outputs. It's hard to imagine a forest being able to do that, but it has happened. So now carbon is being um, you know, sent up to the atmosphere, obviously not what we want. And here's an example of that. This is, um, a study from the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies by Dr. Charlie Cannon that showed the cumulative effects of various forest pests and pathogens that are already present in the Northeast. Now, as you'll notice, those pests and pathogens really didn't have a major impact on carbon biomass until Asi Asian longhorn beetle arrived. Even these three specialist species, emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, and beech bark disease, long term had very little impact on carbon sequestration and storage. It wasn't until that generalist species arrived and has widespread impacts that we see that major dip. That being said, that dip is right where we don't want it to be. Over the next several decades is when we're gonna have the best chance to tackle climate change. 
if we allow this to happen, we're going to have to offset our carbon sequestration and storage in other ways. Okay, so now I want to focus on one last example that's also about invasive pests, but think about over time as these pests aggregate on the landscape. So we had one arrive, let's say it's emerald ash borer. A few years later, we have another one arrive, it's hemlock woolly indelgent. A few years later, we have another one arrive, let's say it's Asian longhorn beetle. This is also a way to turn a forest into a carbon source because you're slowly losing trees over time. The issue is the rate. If it's happening quickly over time, this will happen. If it's happening slowly, the forest will likely plummet, but regenerate. Plummet, regenerate. So we're not really losing aggregate biomass or productivity. I also want to briefly touch, and, touch on the interactive and synergistic effects here. And Jenica is all about this. So we also have these other things like deer and invasive plants that are obviously affecting forest regeneration. So we can't assume that forests are always just going to regenerate when we lose a tree species. That just doesn't happen in most systems, especially in the Northeast. We also have to think about fire. Fire is the, um, the wrench right now in the system. As these trees succumb to invasion and die off, they are pr producing these large amounts of tinder for these massive wildfires out west. And in this instance, all of that stored carbon that is on the ground, as well as the stored carbon in the soil, is lost almost immediately into the atmosphere. So um, examples of like mountain pine beetle out west creating conditions for these massive wildfires are something we need to think about. We also have a lot of forest pests and pathogens here already. This shows the, the number per county across the United States. As I mentioned earlier, we have about 60 plus in the United States and North America alone right now. And current impacts are already pretty severe. So on an annual basis, forest pests and pathogens impact an average 20.4 million hectares in the US, an area almost 50 times larger than fire with an economic impact nearly five times as great. Some of the resulting observed changes are larger in magnitude than those attributed to climate change or air pollution to date. What about projected impacts? An additional 334 million hectares or 63% of the nation's forest land are at risk for increased mortality and 24.8 million hectares are predicted to experience more than 20% loss of host basal area by 2027. 4.4 billion tan oak and oak trees containing approximately 295 megatons of carbon are at risk to sudden oak death in Oregon and California. And forests of Canada could emit between 30 and 245 megatons of carbon dioxide per year as a result of native insect outbreaks. So projected impacts are also looking pretty severe just from those ones that are already here. How about continental impacts? This is a study that just came out a few months ago um, by Seidel et al, and it estimated live carbon at risk from potential future invasion of five current forest pests in Europe as 1,027 tera um, grams of carbon with a recovery time of 34 years. So again, if we lose that amount of carbon over the next several decades and it takes 34 years for those forests to recover and serve as that sink again for carbon that's going into the atmosphere, we are losing ground and being able to meet our carbon reduction goals by 2050. Unfortunately, there has not been a comprehensive analysis conducted for North America on this, and this is something that I'm really pushing for. So um, I serve on the Nature Conservancy's Invasive Species Advisory Committee, and we just developed a NatureNet Science Fellow program to advance this research with um, a, an institution over the coming year. And the, the name of this project is Modeling Impacts of Forest Pests and Pathogens on Carbon Sequestration and Storage in North America. The RFP is open right now. We're looking for interested researchers. We provide a, um, about $20,000 stipend per year for a postdoc to advance this research. So if you are interested in working on this project with us, I'd be happy to talk with you after the presentation. Okay, so granted it's not individual species that are having impacts, it's the severity and whether those species are generalists or not and the rate of introduction that's having the most significant impacts on carb from a carbon perspective, we need to ask, are the rates of introduction decreasing on the landscape? Does anyone see a downward trend on any of those? 
These are from three different publications that two of them looked at the accumulation of forest pests over time. We've accumulated about two and a half species per year over the past 150 years. Unfortunately, the rate of introduction of forest pests and pathogens, or sorry, wood boring insects is increasing. Um, and another one showed the projected uh, introduction of new forest pests over time. They found that from now until 2050, the number of wood boring insects in particular, which are the most severe, could increase from 50 or over 50 to about 300. So projected impacts are not looking good either. And the rate of introduction is not going down. Okay, and lastly, some of you might be like, why, why am I putting such a, um, an ecological issue or couching it under a, a carbon story? And I, I think it's important to recognize that forest pests and pathogens are important to address for a variety of other reasons and probably more important reasons than carbon. They are the only recent forest disturbance, disturbance agent that has proven capable of rendering entire species or genera of trees functionally extinct within a matter of decades. Several new pests now threaten to eliminate or sharply reduce the abundance and cover of other native trees and associated specialist species. The short-term value of damage by three guilds of invasive forest insects is estimated to be about 150 million per year with costs largely borne by homeowners and municipal governments. And increases in mortality related to car cardiovascular and lower respiratory tract illness have been documented in infested counties. So we need to look at the whole story here. Yes, we need to be doing this for carbon, for climate change, but there's a variety of other and more important reasons why it's important to address forest pests and pathogens. Okay, so taken all together, there's an urgent need to address this problem. So what do we do? I really feel strongly about this new policy recommendation that has come out of the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies called Tree Smart Trade. And it focuses on five policy actions that we can take to limit, significantly limit the introduction of new forest pests into the continent. The first is to switch to non-solid wood packaging material. This wood packaging material that we're currently using that's coming in on these freighters down the St. Lawrence is bringing new pests into the country every year. We can minimize new pest outbreak, outbreaks by expanding early detection and rapid response programs. We can augment international pest prevention programs with key trade partners, restrict or eliminate imports of live woody plants that share a genera of those species that we have here, and tighten enforcement of penalties for non-compliant shipments. Okay, I hope you're now looking at this picture and all that stored carbon. And with that, I'll um, thank you and I'll take any questions if I have time.